Natalie's there. And Kayer. Hello, Chris. Can you hear me? All right. We have a relatively full agenda today. Um, I think, or I hope, that the presenters are all here. I have a feeling I'm clicking on the wrong thing to let people speak. Gonna be awesome. awesome. All right. I think we need a Jabber scribe. I can't really keep track of what's going on with the chat and the people that want to talk at the same time. So do it. ideally, oh, okay, good. Yeah, so Shriram's question about do presenters have to enter the queue before their turn comes? Yes, please do that. And Jared is pointing out that as the ITF list is, list is full of messages about, we're gonna get cut off exactly at the end of the time. So why don't we try and get started? Okay, so you're at the Cider Ops meeting. We're going to need somebody to take notes. Natalie's going to take care of the jabber. All right. I can't keep track of the, <laughs> the presentation and the uh, chat, so um, whatever happens. I guess somebody should speak up. One of the chairs, ideally. Okay. There's a note well. Ideally, you've seen this before. Maybe I can make this not quite so. Nope, that doesn't help. Great. Sorry. Okay. We have an agenda. I don't think there's anything else to add to it. Oh, sorry. This is the wrong agenda. <laughs> Well, all right. I guess I just can't make slides properly. Or apparently run a presentation. Anyway, we have four things on the agenda. The first one, I believe, go find it again. Okay, first item on the agenda today is John Kristoff. Let me just do this. No word. Could you expand your slides, please? Now, nobody can read that but me, but sorry, I'll fix it later. Separate Jabber client. Yes, I would love to do that. All right. Hey, hey Chris, um, if you share an application instead of your whole screen, oh, John, 
can present. Let me, I think help. I can stop presenting my screen and maybe John can present his screen now and give his presentation. Well, All right, John, perhaps you should just talk and I can do the slides. It should look like this as soon as I figure out how to make this stupid thing present again. Grand audio, okay, go John. Hello, Mr. Christoph. Pretty sure we can't hear you, John, or at least I can't. This is Jeff. Uh, John, you'll need to click on the share microphone icon that is at the top of the screen. It's the microphone that has the little hand or the one that has the little play icon. Okay. Let's uh, try, see if maybe D Ma wants to give this a whirl while we work on John's connectivity. Ideally, Speak up, Dee, and we'll see if we can get your presentation running. Cannot hear you, Dee. Hello, Warren. This is Warren, just testing to make sure that audio does work for someone. On to a practice session. Oh, son of a biscuit. Nope. So Warren, we were able to hear you fine. John, one of the things that we have not seen is uh, that you've actually shared your microphone at the top of the screen next to your participant thing. There'll be a set of icons, a screen, a video camera, and two microphones. If you click on one of the microphones, that will allow you to talk to other people. Is that the icons are in the upper left, but when you hover over it, this tool tip is in the top center. Hello. Hi, D. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, I sorry. can hear you. Okay. So, shall I get started? Please. 
Okay. Um, hi, folks. Um, um, today I'm going to brief a draft on RPK Valid Daily Cache update in Slurm over HTTPS, um, which can be called RUSH, R U S H for short. During IETF Singapore meeting held last year, I shared this idea um, as well as my personal implementation practice to this working group and also my intention to seek its standardization. And the version 00 draft was therefore submitted in last December. After that, we also received some comments from the community and made Yes, oh, here is my considerations. Um, uh, as for the way of formatting data, we prefer to facilitate the data paths for both visualization and application other than route origin validation, as well as to take advantage of Slurm uh, to have some local version of our PK data. And then we choose HTTPS as a transport at the end of the day because uh, HTTPS is widely supported. It is with security enhancement to offer integrity protection and is protocol data unit independent. Well, uh, when I say it's protocol data unit independent, I uh, well, what I'm getting at here is HTTP is friendly enough to accommodate many kinds of structured data such as JSON, XML, and the YML, etc. So next slide, please. Um, the figure on the right of this page demonstrates an example of a rush operation, which is essentially to place a Slurm file object in the HTTP message body and use a newly defined media type uh, application slash JSON Slurm to indicate this um, extension. So if you are already familiar with IFC uh, 8416, you would find it easy to uh, do a cache update by using some filters and some assertions which are responsible for deleting and adding RPKI validated cache items respectively. So that's the reason why we use JSON to format cache data alignment with the file. 
In other words, we use some file to describe a cache data and its update. Next slide, please. Um, moving along to this slide, um, I would like to reiterate uh, why we employ HTTPS as a transport. Um, RTR is over there. Do we know why bother to do this? I'm justifying what is all about our motivation. Um, RTR is designed exclusively for providing RPK cache for routers. So its PDU is bound to <clears throat> its transport, which is uh, which is difficult to add extension to support these uh, validated cache synchronization management. Well, like the DNS PDU is bound to the DNS transport, so it's hard to do some extension to uh, add to DNS. Okay. Uh, uh, <clears throat> well, I, I see some similar, uh, similarity. Uh, and second. The binary data unit cannot be passed by application, which, by the way, don't support RTR generally. I mean, so maybe in the in the coming future, we we um, <clears throat> oh, we would like to use the uh, vanilla cache uh, for the uh, up there applications. So, um, HTTPS is widely deployed and the data format independent, as I mentioned, and um, uh, RPA vendor cache server just needs one API to do both synchronization and local control since the JSON is employed by Slum file, uh, which by the way is uh, <clears throat> specified in RFC 8416 to override global RPK data. Okay, so um, I mean, if you, uh, if we uh, Use Rush. We can use one, just one API to do both uh, synchronization and local control. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, we uh, make a separate section of Rush uh, use cases in this version, uh, version one, um, help people. Uh, to figure out in which uh, circumstances Rush can be employed to transfer RPK validated cache. And we also have got three cases so far and look forward to see more as we pursue its standardization if this working group would adopt it. Um, uh, use case one uh, would be the cache distribution. Uh, the Rush can be used to distribute RPK the cache within a single uh, AS uh, or network. And a small site uh, or the enterprise network may also use Rush by synchronizing with a third party RPK cache provided over external networks, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this uh, speech. Uh, use case two, uh, uh, we can use Rush to do local control of networks. A network operator may want to inject some assertion or filters via uh, API offered by RPKI validator or cache provider. So Rush is therefore able to carry out such a uh, function. The last one our, um, is about the uh, AS0 uh, uh, information. So uh, uh, <clears throat> not long ago, well, I guess, uh, as far as I know, uh, in the RIBE community or uh, uh, some discussions on uh, uh, how uh, use Slum file to deliver uh, AS0 information uh, uh, has been discussed. And um, the, the IR needs to publish assertions with origin uh, AS0 for all the uh, unlocated and unsigned address space. Uh, for which is uh, uh, for which it is a uh, current administrator. Uh, so Rush is able to deliver such uh, assertions to RPK reliant parties if so-called uh, AS0 file would be generated by IR, such as APNIC or RIPE. Well, I see uh, uh, the proposal uh, has been uh, withdrawn by its order in the RIPE community. Uh, but
Um, well, here is my uh, uh, considerations on uh, rush standardization. Um, rush uh, mainly focus on uh, standardize the transport and the data format of the uh, RPK cache data. Uh, so all we need to do is uh, to make a registration of the application slash JSON Salon media type uh, from IANA. And uh, Rush has nothing to do with synchronization of the Rush and system. Um, uh, we expect the use of Rush in different user cases. Where the push or pull uh, we used for uh, cache synchronization, or uh, uh, how to do resynchronization and uh, access control. Well, which by the way is kind kind of different from what I mentioned in last uh, ITF meeting held in Singapore. Uh, when I <coughs> shared the detail of um, the uh, we our implementation of Rush. So, next slide. <clears throat> um, as for security considerations, um, uh, I think uh, uh, transport. And uh, the out of band trust between cache servers and the subscriber. However, this document is not going to expand on this, but leave it to operational practice. Uh, next slide. Okay, um, that's the, all about uh, what I'm going to talk about Rush so far. And I hope it could be adopted as a working group item. Um, so, thank you. Um, any questions? I believe Randy has a question. Uh, yes, I find the security con considerations quite disturbing. I have, we have a trust model. It's object trust and I just, don't trust getting stuff from random servers that change my view of the RPKI. I like this proposal much better when it was yet more data dangling off the existing trust anchor. Okay. Yep. Who disconnected? Okay. I guess Yob didn't actually have a comment. Um, Rudiger? Or not? Okay. Let's move on to the All right, come on, John and Job, Russell. Is is it working? Yes. Hi. Uh, I would like to echo Randy's Randy's comments on the security considerations. Uh, it seems to dance around the meat of the issue, and specifically in the case of RAR to RAR member that's crossing trust boundaries. And I do not believe that that should be done without object security. So I think the AS0 origination thing is, is uh, a bit of a red herring. It is not a great use case. Okay. How do I shut this down? <laughs> I can kick you out. <laughs> okay, let's try, uh, I think we're, out of time for, for these slides. I think if there's real questions here, we should provide them on the list. We can certainly have an interim if we run out of time here. 
or need in the next bit. Uh, in three or four weeks, we can have an interim meeting to discuss this or other topics. Uh, so why don't we try John? Let me find your slides. John, go. Oh. And we can't hear you. Okay, John says he's having some problems. Why don't we table his presentation for now and move on to Sriram? I have no idea what the what the actual order of slides was anymore because I'm lost. So can you can you hear me? Yes, Chris. Okay, um, actually Oliver is online. Oliver was uh, next. Oh, okay, well we can certainly do that instead. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Ah, uh, wonderful. Okay, I had some. My internet went down this morning, so uh, had some problems. Okay, so um, today I'm talking about or giving an update about the signaling BGP SEC validation state. Um, next slide, please. So uh, during last presentation, we uh, basically proposed to um combine rpk origin validation and bgp sec path validation into the same attribute as was discussed during the adoption call but then when we presented it on ietf 106 in singapore we uh, had some interesting discussions and um, heard some concerns regarding backwards compatibility and other issues and were asked to basically undo this step so what we did, we basically removed the proposed modifications to RFC 8097, uh, and we uh, therefore we removed all the origin validation state, so that at the current um, in the current state, it's basically just BGP sec origin validation. Um, then we added some wording uh, regarding uh, the non-transitivity of the attributes. There also were some concerns, also. Um, um, uh, concerns raised, and we added some, um, we reverted, some, reverted a little bit uh, some parts of the peer signaling. Next, next slide, please. So that is uh, now, again, the um, packet format of the extended community. Uh, we have, it, it looks pretty much the same like the original validation, RFC 90, uh, 8097 uh, attribute except that here the validation state is the BGP sec validation state. Um, and so the only thing there, what we need to have done is uh, we would need the um, uh, the, ty the uh, added the BGP sec path validation state community by IANA into the registry. Next slide, please. So the validation states um, are unverified for zero, um, one valid and two not valid. Uh, nothing changed in there. The valid and not valid come from the RFC 8205. And uh, unverified basically means that this particular router did not validate, be, uh, did not perform BGP sec validation uh, on its own. Uh, next slide, please. So for the non-transitivity, uh, what we basically added into the draft is that uh, the router is only, uh, or if the router did not perform the BGP SEC path validation on its own, then, and it sends this attribute to its peer, then it must set the validation state to unverified. Um, so what this means is basically then, if, for example, a particular router receives a validation state via this attribute, let's say it's valid, 
and it does not perform its own validation state, then it must, if it uh, forwards this update, then it must add the validation state unverified rather than the received validation state valid. And with this, we basically uh, make sure that the attribute stays non-transitive. Next slide, please. Uh, regarding the peer signaling, um, we have wording in there that says basically that uh, uh, each implementation must provide uh, configuration switches for that to enable or disable um, the receiving of these attributes on a per peer basis. Um, that should be by default enabled on IBGP sessions and disabled on EBGP sessions. Next slide, please. Uh, error handling, we um, decided to, well, actually that was, I think, since all the time in there, um, that if I receive more than one of these attributes, then the complete attribute has to be discarded. The same is true in case uh, the validation state is other than the one of the three specified validation states. And then the router must uh, apply a strategy similar to the uh, attribute discard in RFC 7506. I think it is. Uh, next slide. Ah, that's it. So, is there any questions? Job? I'm uh, I'm of two minds whether things should be enabled by default on IBGP sessions, because we noticed with the BGP origin validation extended communities that exist today that some implementations made assumptions about whether that community would be present or not. Uh, ben Madison may be able to highlight the exact details of what that problematic situation was. Uh, but yeah, I would be wary about enabling things by default across uh, all BGP implementations. That, that's fine. We can we can we can uh, certainly uh, think of having this uh, by default all disabled and then having the operator. the the more The more important part for us is that the operator should should have the capability of configuring the enabling or disabling of the attribute. Uh, on a per peer basis that that is the most important part for me um we just were thinking because it makes uh, extremely good sense to have it on ibgp sessions on so that's why we decided or that's why we added the 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 part with it should i mean if, if there's a should you always can have it different anyhow um but yeah i mean there's um no problem I think on it's my good side you are taking this into consideration and are thinking about what the default should be. Uh, so thank you for that. Sure. Ben and then Kayer. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, super. Um, I think when you, Oliver, say um, attribute discard, uh, you mean a specific community, and you don't mean to drop all the communities extended. No, no, just just this particular one. Right. So attribute discard typically, if I recall correctly, drops the entire attribute. You want to have some text that specifically um, references in context of this specific extended community and not the others. That's the only feedback I have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Ben here, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep. So just to follow up on the point that Job was making, um, the particular issue that we came across when we were rolling out origin validation was that the receiving side um, in one implementation makes assumptions about what the absence of an extended community means. And in that case, it was treating anything that it received from an IBGP peer without an 8097 community as valid, which is obviously, which is obviously stupid. Um, but to pre prevent a, a, a kind of a new incarnation of that problem, it might be worth spelling out that a receiving IBGP peer 
that does not receive one of these communities must treat it as having not been validated rather than either positively valid or invalid. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, I mean, the thing, the thing is that I agree to a certain extent. I think actually that the, 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 the receiver should not make any assumption on, on a peer where it doesn't receive anything anyhow. So, so for example, you could have an implementation that uh, allows you to um, specify default validation states, whatever this validation state is and it allows it to the operator. So I, I, I would say that an implementation should not make any assumption whatsoever. Most likely it, it, it will result into unverified, but should not make any assumption whatsoever about uh, the absence of this validation state, or uh, no, sorry, <laughs> the absence of this, uh, this community string. Yeah, and, and to be honest, I mean, the point that I'm making should be sufficiently obvious that the issue would never arise. But as I say, this is a... Oh, no, I, 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 I know, I know exactly what, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, yeah, I saw I, that I, too. I mean, so, certainly there are carve outs that you can make for local policy and so on and so forth. But I think, yeah. you know, giving a big red must to potential implementations is not a bad thing because you know a lot of people got burned quite badly by that implementation choice and origin validation and it would be nice not to repeat it yeah um i definitely will go back to that and think about how we can add that um i agree that at least uh, some some wording has to be added to um to point out this issue um, I don't. I don't know yet, and I want to maybe have this discussion a little bit further offline uh, with my co-authors and everyone who wants to join. Um, if if that should be unverified, I mean, normally, I mean, we don't need to make a big deal out of it, you know. Um, but yeah, so at, at least there has to be a must not assume any validation state whatsoever. Yeah, absolutely. And unverified is not a validation set. So we only have these two valid and not valid. So, um, okay. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Okay. And I think Sri Rao uh, is next. Okay. Thanks. Chris, you can, Chris, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, okay. So this talk is about. Uh, AS hijack detection and mitigation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, recently, like in June and July, uh, there was a NANOP thread uh, discussing AS hijacking, uh, real incidents happening in the internet. And uh, there were questions about uh, what operators uh, can potentially do to prevent uh, hijacking if they have a responsibility to do so. Uh, that motivated us to think about uh, possible prevention mechanisms uh, for AS hijacking. Um, AS hijacking, uh, the definition uh, is uh, AS hijacking occurs when a, one AS uses another AS's number uh, as the origin ASN in a BGP announcement. Uh, it could be accidental or it could be malicious. Uh, the prefix in the announcement may sometimes belong to the hijacker. The hijacker in, that, in this case is an AS and it, the prefix could be one that normally originates from the a hijacker's AS. Uh, but uh, more often, uh, or, or most, mo most likely, uh, the hijack, uh, hijacker is actually hijacking this AS and also hijacking a third-party prefix. Next slide, please. So RPKI uh, uh, origin validation is not sufficient to mitigate uh, AS hijacking. Uh, this uh, slide demonstrates that. Uh, AS1, uh, who is concerned about uh, uh, hijacking of his AS number, uh, has created all the ROAs uh, that, uh, that are necessary for the prefixes that, that it originates. And uh, three uh, is doing validation. Two is, uh, uh, it passes, the update passes through two to go to three. Uh, three is doing uh, RPKI origin validation. Uh, four is, uh, 
hijacker, AS hijacker in this case. And he's hijacking AS1 uh, and announcing a Q, uh, prefix Q, which is a third party prefix and it doesn't have a rover. So three basically determines uh, that uh, Q, Q is not found according to RPKI OV. Uh, and therefore Q um, uh, could accept, uh, uh, three could accept uh, the, the prefix Q and propagate it. So AS hijacking is successful in spite of uh, uh, RPKI origin validation. Next slide. So we propose a, a method in which we propose to create a new RPKI object called REAP. And REAP is used for AS hijack detection and mitigation. REAP stands for ROAS exist for all prefixes. RPKI object, it's an RPKI object that is digitally signed by an AS. Uh, the AS is asserting that the ROAS exist for all prefixes that are originated by it. REAP, uh, REAP object contains only an AS number. So once uh, the REAP object is in place, uh, the detection algorithm is fairly simple. Uh, perform the RPKI OV process as normal. If the result of RPKI OV is not found uh, and the origin AS has a REAP object, then replace not found with invalid. And mitigation is simply uh, that uh, you reject the invalid. Next slide, please. So this slide demonstrates uh, the uh, REAP concept and also uh, it, it asserts that uh, uh, the benefit of REAP accrues right away uh, for, the, for the ASS uh, that, are, uh, that have adopted it. So, uh, so the for for the uh, in, in this picture, uh, let, let let's talk. Uh, yeah, let's talk to, through this example. Uh, AS one uh, basically has created ROAS for all prefixes that originate. Uh, either the prefix owners have created it, or AS one owns some of those prefixes. Uh, all ROAS exist. It creates a REAP object uh, in RPKI. Uh, AS three is validating. Two is not participating in REAP. So we are considering a partial deployment scenario. Um, four is hijacking uh, AS1 and announces a third party prefix Q uh, to three. And three basically looks at the, uh, first does the RPKI OV, determines that Q is uh, uh, not found. Uh, but when it looks at uh, the origin AS uh, with, uh, in the route for Q, uh, it sees AS1 and it says, oh, AS1 has REAP, uh, therefore it uh, changes the not found to invalid validation. And that's how it detects the AS hijack. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so the idea in the previous slide was that um, REAP is uh, robust to uh, a robust in partial de deployment scenarios. Uh, the AS that wants uh, AS hijack prevention and the AS that is doing REAP they both benefit immediately, even though no other ASS uh, are participating. Uh, here we are talking about uh, other mechanisms uh, that do AS hijack detection prevention. Uh, BGP set does it uh, because it requires path signatures and that prevents AS hijacks. Uh, but adoption uh, is a question mark. Uh, when uh, ASPA um, was, was designed for route leak detection and mitigation, but it also, it also has the side benefit uh, that, uh, that it can also prevent uh, AS hijacks. Uh, however, in partial deployment, uh, it is not robust like REAP is. So as we show in this, uh, two in the middle is not doing ASPA. Uh, one is doing it, three is doing it. Uh, four can do a cut and paste attack and be successful uh, either with a third party uh, prefix uh, like Q or, or it could even be successful with uh, a prefix, uh, a sub prefix of uh, AS1 uh, originated by AS1, uh, like the slash 23. So uh, again, the point is that uh, uh, ASPA is capable of uh, AS hijack detection, uh, but in a scenario when there's partial deployment, in this picture, there can be other paths from one to three, but those other paths can may, may be feeding uh, less specific rather than the more specific uh, so, uh, so partial deployment uh, is something that uh, is an issue uh, with ASPA, uh, at least for AS hijack detection, but REAP is robust in partial deployment scenarios. Next slide. I think that's my last slide. 
Um, so anyway, Tess, uh, Chris, you can hear me? I can. I think I broke oh. my <laughs> the oh, <okay>. presentation. <laughs> yeah, never mind. It's uh, I'm done. The last slide is only a uh, summary, and it's not uh, necessary. So John, can you can go ahead. I think John uh, John bailed out on the presentation. So let's see. Oh, uh, no, I see. No, John Scudder is in the queue for questions. Oh, sorry, Scudder. Yes. Yes, please. <clears throat> Nope. Lost. Okay. Does anybody have any questions that could actually speak at the mic? Okay. All right. Uh, we'll be happy to have any. Uh, Rudiger just uh, came on. Um, hi. Uh, hi. What mm, uh, resilience remark? Uh, some people are making a major argument uh, about uh, if uh, a CA fails. Uh, everything will be fine because, uh, well, okay, it means essentially that uh, 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 route origin validation uh, goes into uh, unknown state. Um, I don't really subscribe very much to the argument, but there are people who are making a lot of stuff about it. Uh, we have to expect that the CAs uh, and the uh, related <coughs> segments uh, for the AS and the addresses actually are different. And if you have a failure of the address, CA uh, kind of uh, reap will essentially if if a reap uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, as object uh, is in the AS CA will essentially invalidate uh, all of the uh, AS announcements. Um, and that's at least something that has to go into the security uh, into the securities uh, uh, considerations because it is certainly a point of attack. Oh, I understand the question. Yes. Uh, so thank you. We will uh, put that wording in the security consideration. Uh, the thinking uh, we had on our mind was that uh, if uh, uh, one type of RPI object uh, like uh, ROA is not available, then potentially uh, REAP is not also available it's, and and things, uh, and it will remain uh, in not found state rather than go to invalid. Uh, but uh, certainly uh, your uh, point is well taken and we can include that in the security considerations section. Thank you. Randy? Thank you. And let me just add the remark that uh, I think there has not been a lot of discussion about how uh, the CAs for AS number space and address number uh, address space uh, should be related. But I think it makes a lot of sense to, con uh, to uh, expect that CAs for both spaces in many cases will be different. Separate. Only with the biggest ISPs. Um, the Rudiger points out a serious problem, but he attri attributes it to CA failure. It is also 
RP failure, RP does not reliably fetch from ROA publisher, but fetches from um, the publisher of whatever this object is. I forget the name already. A deep. Um, and uh, disaster happens. This is um, significantly common if John had managed to give his presentation. And I believe the risk is sufficient that um, I cannot in any way support this proposal. Can I ask a clarifying question, Randy? Sorry, Chris. Be seen. OK. Um, you don't support it today because there are RP problems and potentially CA problems. If the RP can be significantly, RP set can be significantly cleaned up so that they understand this failure mode and deal with it appropriately, it doesn't seem horrible as an option. It's unfortunately, John, presentation failure obscures that the relying party universe out there is scary. Okay, I think John said he has a or could make a pre-recorded thing to share for whatever later. So that would be better. Yeah, yeah, to... yeah, yeah. Okay. But, but essentially, um, but essentially. Um, relying parties are not overly reliable. And uh, I don't so think, then, uh, I don't think that it, going down that path is going to be a success path. I think, uh, yes, we have to clean up relying parties, but I believe we're looking at years. So Chris, thank you for your response to Randy's question. Uh, only other thing I want to mention is that uh, this REAP object is something that is signed by the AS owner, uh, and that is same as uh, the ASPA object. Uh, so whatever uh, considerations apply to ASPA also apply to REAP, and we can discuss that further. OK, Yop. It is mentioned that AS hijacking is a concern for AS operators. But for instance, the operators of AS3 uh, between two and four, they uh, never articulated what the exact issues are they experience from people inadvertently using AS3 in their uh, traffic engineering attempts. So in the comments, it was pointed out that it's perhaps reputational damage and maybe there's some operational damage related to monitoring, aka false positives. Uh, but AS spoofing does exist. It's not clear to me how big of an issue it is. What exists, did you say, John? What exists? AS hijacking does exist. We, we oh, do yeah. observe it, but right. it's not clear to me what the cost to our community is. How big of an issue it, is it actually? Yeah, the NANOC discussion um, uh, has, did, did uh, I mean, I don't know if you saw, followed the NANOC discussion. Uh, that seems to say that it is a concern if, uh, and it also discussed if AS operators have a responsibility to try to prevent uh, AS hijacks. Okay, I think we are over time by a little bit. Um, if I think if there's more discussion for this or the other topics, we should definitely have that on the list sooner rather than later, so we don't forget. And if there's interest or or need for an interim meeting to talk about this or other topics, uh, that would be terrific to hear on the list as well. And with that, I think we'll close the session out. I think we can do that. And then whoever is going to be at the GROW meeting can just go to the GROW meeting, which is me. So see you in a bit. Thanks.